Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Alicia and I'm the producer of public programs at the Intrepid Sea Air and Space Museum in New York City. Welcome tonight for our very special museum 40th anniversary year. We are so thrilled to bring you a very exciting and very rare chance to get up close to one of our biggest acquisitions from the past 40 years tonight. So you are going to be able to get a very exclusive behind the scenes look at our F-14 Tomcat, the fighter jet that was made famous, of course, by the movie Top Gun. You'll hear a bit about the development and the history of the plane. And if that wasn't enough, we also have with us tonight two very special guests, our curator of aviation, Eric Bain, and F-14 pilot and former NASA astronaut Scott Altman, who might even share a bit about his experience serving as the stunt pilot for Tom Cruise's character in the original Top Gun movie. Now, after the program, we'll also be hosting an exclusive Q&A session with them just for Intrepid Museum members and Atlas Obscura members. So members, check your emails for that link. You should have received that earlier today. And also, uh, if you're not currently a member, but you'd like to join in on that conversation in just about an hour, we encourage you to click on the link that you can find in the comments or the description of this feed. So if you join tonight, you can actually use a special discount code FLEET20 for 20 percent off. And in addition to tonight's Q&A, your membership is going to give you access to a number of exciting and exclusive members-only events during our upcoming Fleet Week festivities, and also, of course, all year round. So if you have any questions, just contact membership at intrepidmuseum.org about that. So hopefully we'll see you as a member soon. Now, before we meet our guests, everyone, tonight we have a little bit uh, more here first about the Intrepid itself. If you're not already familiar with the museum, our complex is located on the west side of Manhattan, floating right in the Hudson River. And the bulk of our museum is housed inside of a historic World War II Essex-class aircraft carrier, the former USS Intrepid. So for some background, the keel of our ship, the bottom of it, was actually laid in preparation for World War II on December 1st, 1941. And then just six days later, on December 7th, Pearl Harbor was attacked which of course dragged the United States into the conflict and what was estimated to take three years to build ended up taking just 17 months. Now our ship began service in August of 1943. It was active throughout World War II and the Cold War and it also played an important role during the space race as a prime recovery vessel for two NASA spacecraft that splashed down into the ocean after their missions. The Intrepid went on to serve in the Vietnam War on three combat cruises from 1966 to 1968 and a few years later, it was eventually decommissioned to then later become a museum in 1982 after being saved from the scrapyard. So, of course, this year we are celebrating 40 years as a museum, and our mission remains the same, to honor our heroes, educate the public, and inspire our youth. On site, we've got 28 military aircraft, as well as a British Airways Concorde, a Cold War era nuclear submarine, the NASA Space Shuttle Orbiter Enterprise, and of course, the reason why you're all here tonight, an F-14 Tomcat. So everyone, without further ado, I would like to introduce our very special guests for this evening. First, we have Eric Baim, our curator of aviation here at the Intrepid Museum. He served in the U.S. Air Force for 20 years and is a graduate of the State University of New York with a degree in history education. Eric has been on staff for over 16 years, managing the care and refurbishment of our aircraft collection and creates exhibit content and programming for us. He recently also became a grandfather and he's looking forward to inspiring his granddaughter by sharing his interest in the areas of science, history and aerospace. And of course, also joining us tonight, we extend a very warm welcome to someone who is no stranger to the F-14 Tomcat, Mr. Scott Scooter Altman. Scott is the president of the Space Operating Group for ASRC Federal. And prior to his work there, he had a distinguished career with NASA and the Navy. He received his bachelor's degree from the University of Illinois and holds a master's degree in aeronautical engineering from the Naval Postgraduate School. He's a retired Navy captain and a former astronaut, even inducted into the Astronaut Hall of Fame in 2018. A veteran of four space flights, Scott has logged over 51 days in space and commanded the final two servicing missions of the Hubble Space Telescope. He's also logged more than 7,000 hours in over 40 types of aircraft, but he still considers flying the F-14D over Iraq as his peak aviation experience. So thank you so much for joining us tonight, and I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you guys. 
Thank you, Elisa, and welcome everybody to a beautiful evening in New York City. It is just gorgeous up here. We were worried about the weather leading up to this event, but obviously for nothing, not a cloud in the sky. And uh, I found out a little earlier tonight uh, that this guy is exactly like 10 days older than me. But if you hear our bios, uh, he lived a whole lot more life than I have. I feel like, uh, do you have a grandchild? I do now have a grandchild. I am one up. I am one up on yeah. an astronaut. Okay, so I'm, I'm I do down. have a grandchild. You do. Yeah, I'm she's one down again. Months old. I'm one down again. So oh, all right, yours. she's two. Oh, you got a year on me. All right. Well, still, I wanted one thing over <laughs> you, man. Oh man. So I, we want to talk about you. We want to talk about this airplane. But uh, first of all, start off with where'd you come from? Where where'd you grow up? And what was your inspirations to uh, become a pilot? Well, you know. That's a long story, but when I was three years old, I was watching a TV show called Sky King, yeah. and I turned to my mom and dad, and I said, I want to be a pilot. They were both teachers. They looked back at me, and they said, you know what? Good luck. You can do anything you want if you do three things. You know, work hard, do your best, and don't give up. So uh, I went through school. I remember watching the first moon landing yeah. in 1969 and seeing those guys do it. But really, I just wanted to be a pilot. I thought space was really cool, but it didn't seem like it was real people who did that. So growing up in the Midwest, I labored under the misperception that the Air Force was the place to go. So I applied to the Air Force Academy. But when I took the induction physical, they said, Altman, you're too tall to be a pilot in the Air Force. Fortunately, I found out a year later the Navy had different standards, and I joined the Navy and have had a great time flying since then. Now, the truth was he wasn't good enough to be in the Air Force, <laughs> good, good, good looking enough to be in the Air Force. Saved from a fate worse than death, as <laughs> I put it. Well, we'll talk about this Air Force-Navy rivalry a little bit, I think, because I know some of your stories that are great, okay, great, great stuff. But let's, so you became a pilot and got into the Navy. How'd you go from Air Force to Navy? Explain that a little more. So, uh, I can tell my story through movies a lot of times. Uh, but the first movie is called An Officer and a Gentleman, where Richard Gere goes, and he would have gone to Pensacola in the movie. He goes to somewhere like in Washington State. Anyway, that's what I did. I went through Aviation Officer Candidate School. We actually did it between summers. It was like summer camp, eight weeks of getting yelled at by a drill instructor <laughs> and pt to death. But uh, then I went back to college, graduated, came back, finished up, got my uh, commission as an ensign in the Navy and went off to flight school in Pensacola, then jets in Kingsville. And it was actually when I was in Kingsville, we had a debt out to uh, El Central, California. And it was November. So it turned out November 11th was a Thursday. That was a no-fly day. So that Wednesday, we all jumped in the duty van and drove to Miramar, over the hill to Miramar. And just driving over the hill and looking up at Miramar, seeing all these airplanes coming into the break, A4s, F-14s, F-4s. It's like, man, this is the <laughs> promised land. This is where I want to go. And fortunately, when I got my wings, I got orders to an F-14 squadron at Miramar, which was just straight into the F-14. Yeah. Excellent. Now, even I don't want to get ahead on your story, but did you have any uh, inclination that you try to get into NASA someday and fly the space shuttle at that point? Or was that not even in the cards yet? So my career is a series of different events, uh, kind of where I go continually reinventing myself as a rookie again. Yeah. So I'm flying the F-14. I have an engineering degree, and a buddy gives me a pamphlet on test pilot school. I was like, hey, that sounds cool. That's a way to do engineering and fly. So I apply, I get accepted, go to test pilot school. And then as part of that, we took a field trip, and we went to Houston, and I met actual astronauts. And I realized for the first time two things. One, astronauts are actually real people. I don't think I believed that before. But I met them, and a lot of them had a career kind of like mine before they got selected. And the second thing I realized was I really want to do that. So I applied, got rejected, applied again, and uh, got accepted the second that time. That seems to be a common theme with astronauts I talk to. It takes a couple tries. Yeah, some guys get in on the Don't give up. Don't yeah, give up. That goes back to that same thing I said. Do your best. Work hard and don't give up. So let's talk about the, one of your favorite airplanes. My Can favorite, I say your definitely the my favorite. favorite airplane, the number one airplane. Anything. I was just thinking about this the other day. You know, if if I could go back to be a lieutenant in a fighter squadron flying the Tomcat again, that's a dream come true. Well, tell us something 
special features of this great airplane then? It's a, an amazing airplane, you know, from nose to tail, the capability that it has. Uh, up to 72,000 pounds launched by this little tiny knob here, throwing that whole weight off the ship. That's amazing to me. The uh, ramps here are made to Pretty drop shallow. down, to get the shockwave perfectly positioned within there uh, so that the, the engine is protected. And it makes the airplane capable of Mach 2, which is incredible. What kind of uh, weapons did you watch out for that? What kind of weapons did you uh, carry? So, and it thing? could carry a lot of air-to-air uh, -air weapons when I was flying it. We later brought air-to-ground on board. But the, the preeminent missile of that time Bring is... Bring the camera down this way is the AIM-54 Phoenix missile. Now, the, the Phoenix is about 1,000 pounds, so when you had that on board, you had to do all that and calculate what your weight was before you rogered the weight board to get catapulted off. But the Phoenix was a, a huge, beyond visual range missile. You could fly and track 24 targets with the uh, track wall scan radar, and you could launch six Phoenix at once against an enemy bomber fleet if they were ever coming fire in. Fire and forget, was that the proper terminology? All, well, there's a point at which you could forget it. You would guide it to a certain point, and then the Phoenix has an active radar in the nose that would take over the terminal phase and glide. So at one point, you could let it go on its own, and it would be it could get all the way there. Now, it's not the only missile we carry. There's also the AIM-7 Sparrow missile, which uh, was 500 pounds, and a great missile. You had to stay locked on with us. You couldn't shoot that in track wall scan. You had to have a, a solid track of a single object there when you shot that off. And then the Sidewinder, probably one of my favorite missiles, heat seeking missile. Uh, you get a tone, you hear it in your headset, and you pull that, and that is fire and forget. It's locked on and it's going to hit what it, it's looking at. Wow. And, of course, you have a gun on this thing. Don't you? And we have a, a Mark 61 uh, Falcon machine gun, really capable. We would typically fly uh, with around 600 rounds in the gun, uh, and you could be through you know, that in an incredibly short period of time. When you fire a 50-round burst, it sounds like, and that's it. You've shot 50 shells already. Okay. Well, uh, if you have questions, more, you know, deeper questions, if we don't cover it, uh, please ask those in the, uh, the chat, and Alicia will get those up to us. Um, one of the most prominent features on this airplane, though, of course, is the swing wing. Yeah. So if we come back here, I'm going to try to get out of your way so you could talk about the wing and its positioning and how it moves. So the pivot point is right here. And so the wing is currently in its stowed position to try and give you the minimum uh coverage on the flight deck when you're trying to stack all these airplanes on a flight deck. So it's swept to 72 degrees. Once you got in it and started up, you'd pop it out and bring it out to 68 degrees, which is where as far aft as it would normally go in flight. And then when you get up to the cat, bring it all the way forward, put down the flaps and get ready to launch off the cat with the wings at 20 degrees. Uh, then once you're in the air, you have a little switch uh, on the throttle that you can command the wings back, or you can leave it in auto, and they'll sweep where they're supposed to be, depending on how fast you're going or what kind of a G-load you're putting on the airplane. Now, uh, was there any difference between the, those first F-14s you flew and maybe some of the later models that uh, were upgraded? What were the big differences? Well, the, the one big difference between the original F-14A and the F-14B and D is uh, you can kind of see this sticker on the side of the uh, engine GE. We went from Pratt and Whitney, Whitney engines in the original model, which really were not the engine that the F-14 was designed around, um, and got the GE F-110s, which almost doubled the thrust. I'll never forget the first time I'm flying a B with the big engines, and I'm zooming up and fighting around like this. I'm like, man, where have these engines been all my life? This was awesome. <laughs> They're holding out on yeah. you. So was that a development? Was there a problem developing that engine or just uh, came along later? Yeah, the Navy kind of ran out of money. The TF-30 was plant, it was actually out of the F-111, as I understand it. And said, okay, we'll just keep that package together. Because some of the F-14 came out of F-111 development. Right. Although they realized the F-111 was way too big of a whale to be a Navy. Yeah. I worked on those in the Air Force. And that's a, a long story, that F-111 to F-14 story. Yeah. Look it up. It's fascinating. Um, but 
was this an easy airplane to fly or were there bugaboos you had to kind of look out for or what, what's going on here? So that <clears throat> it was a really fun and really capable airplane, but you needed to be a pilot to fly it, especially the early models. Right at the end of the F-14's life, they came out with a mod called Digital Flight Control System, which added some capability to help the pilot out. But the early ones were really cool in a lot of ways because if you knew what you were doing you could kind of trick the airplane into doing what you wanted for instance pulling up into really slow flight and uh, if you normally would move the stick one way the airplane would go the other but if you know that's where you want to go you cross control the wrong way and the airplane goes where you want it to even though you're slow and you could use the rudders a lot in the airplane so uh and then you could do things like uh, flying into the merge and putting your wings all the way back manually. So a guy, look, oh, he must be going really fast. He's not going to be able to turn. And then all of a sudden you put your rock turn on and, and gun the guy. So did the Navy have any dual control F-14s or when you took your first flight in F-14, it was the first flight in you F-14? You were up there, yeah. There, was there a lot of sim time leading up to There was it? a lot of sim time. Yeah, you sat in there. And the, the sim was a pretty good predictor of how the airplane would fly. And you're not landing on the boat the first time you fly. And that's the nice thing about Navy airplanes. They don't bounce. You know, you can come in almost, you know, at any rate of descent. You hit and you're on the ground. So uh, it doesn't take a lot of finesse until you get to landing on the ship and you're trying to put it in that one little spot. Wow. And landing on the ship, uh, that's got to be some harrowing and stories with, with that. So... You first land in the training command, go out to the ship in T2s in my day and A4s, and then uh, you get in your fleet airplane and you go out at night because it's all day in the training command. And once you get kind of experienced, the daytime is kind of fun. You can see the ship, everything, you know where you are, you're flying the ball, you come in, and it's usually pretty decent weather. At night, it's another story. And it seems that the to be that at night is when the ship likes to move around a lot. So you're coming in on approach and the ship is moving and you're trying to figure out where you are. There are times where you could get in, be flying a good pass, but you're just out of position with the ship and the, the, the landing signal officers wave you off and say, okay, not this time, try again. Then there are times where you're not in sync with the ship and they wave you off to go around. So, uh, um, the carrier landings are something you remember. Any other night stories that uh, might uh, raise the hair on the back of your neck? Well, or any uh, any any mishaps in the air? Or fortunately, I didn't have any mishaps. I, the one night story that comes to mind doesn't have a carrier in it, but I was 200 miles out uh, over the ocean doing a high-speed flyby over a destroyer, where they practice their missile defense for incoming targets. So we buzz the destroyer, and all of a sudden, uh, smoke fills the cockpit, and I get a, a, a firelight. And it turns out my environmental control system turbine had caught on fire. So we're doing all these steps to try and manage the fire, get it to go out. But in the back of my mind, a good buddy of mine, Junior, had had the same failure three weeks earlier at Miramar and had to jump out of the airplane. You mean eject? Eject, yes. So I'm sitting there going, oh, man, I do not want to go swimming tonight, 200 miles off the coast. In the dark. In the dark, yes. Hopefully somebody would come and get me. But uh, so we're doing everything, and, and we head back to the beach, and the weather moves in. We're trying to fly an approach with some of the things turned off. The airplane's not flying quite right. But we did break out underneath and got back on deck, and uh, I got award for saving the airplane but, but what's going through your mind that's um you're telling this story like yeah and this and that and this and that but what what were you feeling you know trying to get back to shore was it like was it running through your head i'm gonna swim tonight or it sure seemed like a good possibility the whole because i didn't know if the fire was completely out and the problem is that where that was located it would burn through the flight controls and then you wouldn't have any control so I'm kind of feeling, trying to be gentle and not stress anything too much. But this uh, isn't a fly-by-wire airplane. You're no, no, you have control rods that go out to the hydraulics that move the surfaces. Uh, and if something happens to those, then you're not flying anymore. Wow. I, I, I can't imagine that. Did you, ever, you never had to eject out of anything, did you? Fortunately, every airplane I took off in, I was able to land in. Yeah. There were some questions at times if that was going to happen, but... Uh, <laughs>
Fortunately, we made it through. Uh, you were telling me a story about a flap up departure, 600 feet. Uh, that that was a pretty good story. Uh, that that scared me. That was another one of those. I was just kind of like one of those things. But tell that story. Our viewers would love that. All right. So uh, before I finished up in the F-14 replacement air group, kind of the training squadron, and got ordered to VF-51. And because I did pretty well in CQ, they sent me to a squadron that was going to sea in like uh, six weeks. So I'm in the new squadron, and we're they call it bouncing. It's where you go out and do 10 landings to try and get practice, everything flying the ball. And one of the sessions is called an emergency period where you try doing all these different configurations, one of which was flaps up. Now, our plane had uh, these painted slats. You can see the slats right here. They're supposed to be uh, aluminum and not painted because the paint changes the stall characteristics. So these articulate downward to change the shape yeah. of the airfoil and add more lift. That's what the slats are, in case anybody's wondering. Exactly right. So you have flaps on the back and slats on the front. So as it usually is in a chain of events, there were a couple of things. One, the slats were painted. So two, I had an angle of attack gauge that was uh, sticking and not being accurate. Normally, you compute the airspeed you should fly at and use the angle of attack gauge as the truth data and back it up with airspeed. So the AOA was sticking, so I was just computing airspeed and flying that airspeed, which I thought was correct, but because the slats were painted, we were actually too slow. And you fly the carrier pattern at 600 feet above the ground. Uh, and we're on downwind going along I'm, sl I'm slowed all the way down to on speed, and uh, all of a sudden the airplane rolls to the right a little bit. I'm like, okay, let me just fix that with a little left stick. So I put a little left stick in, and the airplane rolls further. And what I realize at that moment is we're getting adverse yaw, and we're stalled. That the airplane is going to, if I keep moving the stick left, we're going to keep going right, and that's not going to be good. So I have to say, okay, even though I don't want to go right, I have to move the stick back to the center, to stop the roll, which means the airplane falls through. Now, all of a sudden, I'm at 400 feet looking at dirt through the cockpit window and adding power and starting to come around uh, and bottom out and just petrified that my back seater is going to wake up and kind of go, wow, ah, what's happening? And pull the handles. I'm going, I got it. I got it. Because <laughs> he's seeing dirt, too, yeah, when he he's, wakes he's up. Right. Out there, oh, man. <laughs> So uh, once again, that event started at 600 feet of altitude. Uh, the cool and calm. This is why I was not a pilot. I would have been all day long jumping out of that thing. Uh, amazing, amazing that you could think through a problem in split seconds. But that's probably why you became an astronaut too. Maybe it helped. I don't. Maybe know. Maybe it helped. Now you, we looked at the three weapons right here that we have on our display airplane, uh, and they're all air to air. Right. Did this airplane ever have an air to ground capability? So when they first brought out the F-14, it was with the idea that it would have an air-to-ground capability. And the racks that you actually have on here had the capability of ordnance being put on them. But when the Marines didn't buy the F-14, the Navy said, we want an air-to-air -air superiority fighter, and we're not going to do the air-to-ground mission. So, okay. But then times changed, and around 1989, the Navy said, you know, we should look at putting... Uh, air to ground munitions on here. We yeah. had uh, things going on in Kosovo and the, the Gulf War was heating up. So we started doing weapons separation on the F-14 while I was flying as a test pilot, which was actually a lot of fun to do. You'd fly with the bombs on, go out and hit a test point where, okay, I want to separate these bombs at 600 knots at 10,000 feet in X dive angle and, uh, and see how they come off. You'd have cameras on board, and a chase plane that would film. And bombs coming off the F-14 were kind of an interesting thing. You would think if you dropped them off in sequence, you'd have one, two, three, four. But what happened is you'd have one bomb that would pass the other bombs, and you would see the splashes then later. It was like one, one, two, and four, or... Just the funny aerodynamics, the aerodynamics coming, coming out of the tunnel there. Now, what about balance? When I worked on the F-111, and when I was in the Air Force, uh, if the bombs came off asymmetrically, there was a problem. Do you have any kind of issues with that? So we were worried about that. I mean, we could carry four 2,000-pound bombs underneath there. Wow, that's a lot. So the, the question would be if the forward bombs came off and the aft bombs did not, that would change 
the center of gravity of the airplane. And as your center of gravity moves aft, the airplane gets more unstable to the point where you would not be able to land on the ship. So we did an experiment that I ran as a test pilot to see, okay, what should you do if you have uh, captive ordnance in the back? And it turns out with the swing wing, you normally would have the wing way forward, which moves the center of pressure forward. But if you swing the wing back, the center of pressure moves aft and you can restore that delta between the CG and the center of pressure and make the airplane stable again. Now, the downside is the more you move the wings back, the faster you have to be coming aboard the ship. But we figured out what the best place was and said this would be more optimal. The other thing that happens is it, when the wings were full 20 out, there's uh, flaps out here and there's something called aux flaps that are kind of right in this area. And once you sweep a little bit, you can't have the aux flaps down. So, again, that makes you a little bit faster. The inboard set. But the... Uh, yeah. The ship could handle it. You just ask the captain to put a few more knots on, get a little more wind over the deck, right, and you have a pretty right. good. So I'm looking at the airplane, and I noticed, uh, I, I mentioned I worked on the F-111. You had the same system with yeah. the swing wings. And uh, we had problems with this. It's an inflatable yeah. airbag. The airbag, yeah. And it, it keeps the wing tight in all motion. And we had trouble with the F-111 because if you lose pressure, then you got a bad flutter. Was that kind of I never no problems with the F-14? With the F yeah, they we, figured it out. They left time that one to... behind. Good, yeah. good, because it was uh, it was a pretty scary situation for those guys that I that yeah, I talked to yeah. when, when you had flutter on one wing and not the other. The, funny, the first guy that I flew with at NASA on STS-90 was Rick Surfoss, who was an F-111 guy. Oh, it was okay. kind of funny having two swing wing guys in the front seat of the shuttle. <laughs> that, that, that's a great story. Yeah. That, that's an aviator story. That, 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 that. Um, what, what other things about the F-111 that were uh, different and special that you had to look out for? So uh, it seemed to be accident prone at one point. Well, uh, we had trouble with hydraulics. They lost the very first F-14 with the failure of hydraulics. Uh, my very first flight in my fleet squadron, we were out bouncing, and I lost hydraulics and came back and actually took a trap on the field that very first time, uh, which was kind of fun. I mean, uh, better than having it happen out at the ship. And I actually, because you put the hook down and it dragged on the concrete runway, they had to take it off. And instead of throwing it away, they gave it to me. So it's now a little... Uh, memento that I have. The very time, end you know, of the hook. The very end of the hook, the part you can see where the cable would come across. And there's this one bolt that's, I don't know, not in it, three quarters of an inch. And that's where all the weight of this airplane gets through that point when you get a, a single plane. bolt. Single bolt. Well, that's why they try to make sure that stays in good shape. You're an engineer. You understand that you can make a single bolt strong enough to do that, I guess. Yeah. But yeah. Amazing stuff. Now, we, we bantered about a little bit about uh, the Air Force guys. Did you ever get to fly your F-14 against any Air Force guys? Well, there is a big exercise uh, that the, the Air Force runs called Red Flag out of Nellis Air Force Base in uh, Las Vegas. And we would go there. Uh, actually, every squadron I was in, we had at least one detachment to a Red Flag. And it's a huge uh, training area that you fly in and everybody's instrumented so they know where you are and what's going on. And you would, uh, they always made us the red force. We were the bad guys. So <laughs> we would plan how we were gonna go out and defeat those guys. And, well, you're on their home turf now. And for, we're on their home for turf. For the benefit there. We would go, we would take off and go one way, they would take off and go the other. And then you kind of run around and have this big uh, fight song like this. And- uh, Not unlike the movie. In, in a lot of ways. Yeah. I mean, the movie, the tax range stuff where they're showing them in the Top Gun school was pretty accurate. I mean, you go out and you do those things, you debrief stuff, you run the tapes again, you know, why'd you do this? What was that like? So, and they do the same thing at uh, Red Flag. Now, the funny thing for me, because the, the F-15 guys in the Air Force feel like they're the biggest gun in the world and that they are the elite. Easy now. Okay. Right. I'm being pretty kind so far. So you, you'd come in and we'd say, well, you know, I shot an F-15. They go, oh, no, no. But one day we came in and uh, we had actually, my airplane had gone down in the chocks, so we didn't get out to the range. The F-15 guys come in and say, oh, we saw the F-14s at 40 miles. We shot, turned, and left. You guys are all dead. I'm like, uh, 
Sorry. We weren't out there today. We went down in the shots. I don't know who you killed, but why not? <laughs> Did you get to meet these guys like at the club later or they, what? They were in the, the back of the debriefing room. You know, interestingly enough, we didn't pal around that much. That really? I remember. The inner service rivalry stayed in the air? Uh, uh, I heard a story about something at the O Club. <laughs> what happened at the O Club? Well, this is, goes back to F-15 guys. They have a tradition of wearing this very nice, fancy silk ascot with their flight suits. has, like, their squadron logo on it. And things. Well, that harkens back to the days of World War One when you had open cockpit. Yeah, yes, yeah. I'm sure right around the corner from the F-15 top. <laughs> so they're in the old club like that, and we're just in our, our you know, grungy green flight suits with nothing like that. Funny. Okay, guys, come on. We all go into the bathroom. We wrap some toilet paper around our necks and make a, our own toilet paper ascot and come out like, hey, how do we look? What do you guys think? Until eventually, uh, in order to save destruction of the club, they asked us to leave. <laughs> it's like those old 1940s movies where the Navy and the Army guys yeah, start fighting. Yeah, there fighting. is a movie like that. Where <laughs> have to pick, yeah. Um, <laughs> you, you, you got any more rivalry stories? There was one you were mentioning, something uh, well. Uh, yeah, th there is one that I really uh, would like the opportunity to explain. Okay. So um, we came back from cruise. I got selected. We filmed the movie Top Gun. Uh, the, eventually, the movie came out, and then we were on cruise. And part of the cruise, we stopped by the Philippine Islands. And the Air Force had a base there, Clark Air Force Base. So we had planned to do these joint exercises with the Air Force. But we were flying off the boat while they were on land. And uh, some of the guys, Navy guys, were flying around and they would see Air Force guys and they would jump them and start fighting without a brief, which is against the rules for the Navy and the Air Force. But you did it anyway. They did it. They had an exercise where we were staged an attack on Clark Air Force Base and ran stuff. And uh, I actually... <laughs> was the lead and I'm looking at my watch on, okay, we got still got five minutes time on target. We're gonna rig the field. So I got my division and we came down Clark Field at 500 feet. I'm like, it's still our time on target. And as we're going by, I see some F5s going this way into the break over our head. Oh, I'm glad I didn't run into those guys. So now there's a big flap and the Air Force says, no more Cope Thunder for you guys until you get a safety brief from our colonel. Like, okay, so we pulled into the PI by now and the guy comes down and he's in our ready room. He spends a half an hour saying, hey, you can't jump people you haven't briefed with. Don't do this kind of stuff. And those guys who rigged the field at that low pass, that was unacceptable. I didn't say I still had time, but I kept my mouth shut. And then the guy finishes up. All right, you guys, I know you have egos. I've seen Top Gun, but keep it cool. <laughs> and my CAG, to his ever-loving credit, stands up and goes, oh, yeah? Well, I've seen Iron Thunder, and you guys are all pussies. And I'm <laughs> out of the room. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. That's oh. brilliant. I would have laughed at that, even in an Air Force uniform. I would have yeah, laughed see, at that. That's yeah. good stuff. Now, you mentioned the Top Gun movie. What was your role in the first movie? We got the second movie just about to, just about to open come. another yeah. week or yeah. so, I think. I'm looking and forward to seeing the, that. The pre-screenings are already out there. The reviews are coming in. It's uh, got a lot of great action. It's probably all CGI'd now. No, I, I, from what I hear, Tom wanted to do as much as stuff with real airplanes. Most We did most of Top Gun with real airplanes. You played with Tom Cruise. Yeah. So did you get to meet him? And we did, yeah. Got yeah. to talk to him. Uh, got my Tom Cruise stories. I mean, I've been asked before, did you fly in Tom Cruise's airplane in Top Gun? And I say, no. Tom Cruise flew in my airplane in Top Gun. <laughs> did you get to take him for a flight? Yeah. You did. Yeah, him and Goose. Those were the two Goose, guys. I met him. That's Anthony Edwards. Uh, he came here, and I brought him out, and he talked about flying. Flying, yeah. With yeah. Real, he says nothing like He just went on and on and on. I was scared to live in the lights out of him. Well, we did some pretty dramatic stuff when I flew him. They wanted to get departure stuff. So they said, okay, pull the nose up and then a lot of rudder and the thing just swoosh, slices like that. And it's kind of freaky for a guy who's not used to flying. Uh, but he held his cookies, did not, did not lose them in the airplane. What, are, what other scenes in the movie are we actually seeing you? So uh, the very beginning of the movie when you see an F-14 for the first time and you see two guys flying it, I can I know that's me in the cockpit because you see 
how high the guy's head is in the cockpit. That's my tall sitting height. So I'm like, oh, yeah, that was me. I had to wear Maverick's helmet, which was supposed to be form fit for me. But it turned out they only paid to form fit them for the actors. So I had to wear Tom Cruise's form fit helmet on my giant head, which was not a form well, How tall is Tom Cruise? Well, about there, yeah. Yeah, I'm really. Seven, little... so, yeah. <laughs> but uh, he was very respectful of the airplane, listened to the briefs, paid attention. Um, so, and then was so enamored of flying that when he got done, he became a pilot. Right. Now he owns a P-51 and I don't. Oh, this is taking for a ride. There's yeah, some yeah. two C-51s out there. Yeah. And he is somewhat vertically challenged. And uh, <laughs> point number three, although his publicist asked me not to say this anymore, he did fill his air sickness bag. So, well, but you can't blame him. When you do it, when we took guys up for rides, if we're not flyers, we always told them to eat bananas before they came out. They thought, well, does that make my stomach settle? No, they just taste good coming back <laughs> up. So uh, that's a good story. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, the Top Gun movie, the new one coming out, uh, they didn't call you and say, come on out. And you know, it would have, it's interesting, though, because I saw Tom Cruise uh, in 2001. He was doing the voiceover for an IMAX movie called Space Station. So he came to Houston and was walking around. And I was in a sim getting ready to go fly my first Hubble mission. Uh, and we heard, oh, hey, Tom Cruise is in town. He's going to come over. So I had my pilot, who was the photo TV lead, he said, okay, we want to get video of Tom when he's over here. We'll take it up with us on orbit, and then we'll beam it down and say, hey, look who's up here with us right now. But so Digger spends all morning in the, the sim figuring out how to have the camera on without the red light telling him that it's running because we had been told no pictures of Tom. But I think I overemphasized the size thing. So he had a fixed camera position. Uh, Tom shows up. He's got Penelope Cruz with him and his kids. He goes up to the flight deck. I stayed on the mid deck and talked to Penelope for a little while. And then uh, uh, Tom came down, left. We talked for a little bit. Uh, it was funny because he comes around the corner and he said, hey, Scooter, good to see you again. And I'm like, hey, Tom, nice to see you, too. The funny thing was my call sign wasn't Scooter back when we did the movie. It was D-Bear, if you look at the credits. So I'm like, he must have come around the oh, the next guy you're going to see is Scott Alden. His call sign Scooter now. You flew with him in Top Gun. You know, <laughs> Just a reminder. <laughs> so anyway, Tom comes down. They leave. And we're like, okay, Digger, let's see the footage. And uh, we play it back. And you see a guy from here down. I'm like, oh, that's not going to work. Come on. <laughs> Yeah, well, we'll get him when he goes down the ladder. But he went down the ladder backwards, so you just see the back of his head going down. Like, oh, oh that's no so good. we had nothing. Not good at all. Well, anything else you want to tell us about this airplane? We probably have some questions coming in. Uh, at least if you, if if any came in, you could uh, pipe them up. But is there anything else about the F-14 that sticks in your head that they would like to know? Well, just because I've been picking on the F-15 a little bit, I will tell another F-15 story. But it relates to the landing gear. Now, if you look at the size of the landing gear, that is a really beefy landing gear, you know, big, solid uh, thing. And F-14s and Navy airplanes in general don't bounce, right? You're talking about the strut yeah, right here. Yeah, the strut right there. And it would, you know, drop down about two feet, I think, when you're coming in. But it really absorbs the fall, even though you're coming in at about 25 feet per second for a, an F-14 arrested landing. Now, the F-15 has a lot spindlier landing because they're all trying to come in gentle and touch down, all gentle and pretty in that. <laughs> but they took an F-15, it was actually SMTD, uh, short field takeoff and landing, maneuvering technology demonstrator, uh, regular landing gear. It had new engines. It had different fly-by-wire stuff. It had some canards up on the front, and, too. And big canards up in the front, yeah. It was a really cool airplane. I got to come out for the Navy evaluation of the airplane, but the day before I was going to fly it, we had, I had made arrangements to drag a Navy Fresnel lens, the thing that you fly the ball on, and they put it there at Edwards. So these guys came in and they flew the ball. And the system was great. You could really do a nice ball flight, but they flew it all the way to touchdown. And that was a mistake because their airplane had two things. One was an auto derotation capability of doing it. Sensed weight on wheels, it would derotate so you could stop as fast as possible. 
Well, the other thing it had was regular F-15 landing gear. So they're flying a Navy style port. They hit, and what do they do? They bounce. Auto derotation kicks in, and they land on the nose, oh, and then bounce and take off. And the chase guy looks and oh, your landing gear's yeah, you 45 break, degrees. You, know, you just broke a landing yeah. gear. So they came back, landed on the lake bed, and towed it in and, and fixed it. They're like, so, but I get out there and they're like, okay, I'm ready. When is my flight going to be? Well, it's going to be a while before we get this thing back wow, out of the yeah. ground. As a maintenance guy, I would be really upset. Yes. So, Air Force guys, give us a break. I, All right. We understand the aviator thing. It's uh... <laughs> Well, the other thing about the new movie Top Gun is they're only flying F-18s in it. But you got to give them a break. That's all they got. They don't have an air superiority fighter to use in the movie like they did last time. So, so what's your opinion of these new airplanes out there, like the 22, the 35 for 35, the new F-18 Super Hornet? The interesting thing is they would all complain about the F-14 being an aluminum overcast because it's so big. You look at an F-18 Super Hornet, it's almost the size of an F-14. The weight is very similar, yeah, too. Yeah. It's really getting up there. Uh, is it more capable? <laughs> I'll put you on the spot. I still believe, I mean, the F-14 could have been and continue to be a great air superiority fighter and, and air to ground even. Uh, the Navy just didn't make the investments in it. They say it costs too many maintenance hours, but I think if we had the part support the F-18 had, we would never have had the, the maintenance uh, problems that we right. did. When I was a maintenance officer, we were playing catch up, moving parts from one airplane to another because I couldn't get replacement parts fast enough. Yeah. Oh, well, the other thing that's really important in your life is you moved on to the space shuttle. True enough. Why? <laughs> what, what brought that about? Was, was that that childhood thing coming back or? So uh, I told you I interviewed with NASA the first time and didn't get selected. And in a way, that was what I really wanted because I was at the point where I was getting ready to leave the test center, testing the F-14D and go back to the fleet to fly the F-14D in operational missions. And uh, so I did that and got one more cruise. I was actually on cruise when NASA had a call for applications and I sent mine in and they called me on the ship, which was rare back then, uh, 1994, and said, hey, Scooter, can you come to Houston for an astronaut interview? So I had to go to my skipper and say, hey, skipper, NASA wants me to come back for an interview. What do you think? And he said, well, let me check with CAG. They come back and said, okay. So that next day I got on a helo because it was right before we pulled out into Blue Water Ops and I wouldn't have been able to get off the ship. And I heloed into Bahrain, spent the night, got on a uh, British Airways flight and was flying back to Houston. And I, I realized nobody on this ship talked to NASA but me. I should have pulled this a month ago. Hey, NASA wants me to come home. What do you think? <laughs> you could have snuck out at any time. Yeah. Well, you did. But, but uh, honesty pays off in the long run. So I uh, did the interview, met the ship back in Tasmania. Then we finished our cruise and came home. And uh, I got the word later on that NASA had picked me up and I got to be a space shuttle guy. All right. So that's that's a whole other story. And all of, how are we doing on time, Desiree? We been about 15 minutes, so we're good, we're good on time. We okay, can talk good. about space shuttle stuff. Uh, was that uh, the big change in how you be an aviator? It seems like uh, you're you're along for the ride for a lot of that space shuttle stuff. How was that different? Well, in a lot of ways, it was similar. I mean, you train for the worst possible thing to happen, and you right. always try to be ready yeah. for the next worst thing and anticipating what that could be. And then the teamwork. I mean, flying an F-14, it was not just the two of us in the cockpit. It was everybody on the flight deck being able to get us off the thing. And at NASA, it's really more of that. It takes an even bigger workforce to get everybody ready. You got the folks who trained you on all the systems, the folks in mission control who watched over you while you were in flight and trained with you as well. You got the people at uh, uh, Kennedy who got the vehicle ready to go. And then on my Hubble flights, we had the folks at Goddard who built the instruments mm -hmm. and uh, helped train us on how to install them in the telescope. So it really was a huge workforce coming together and trying to understand, take advantage of the best of every uh, part and get everybody to work together was one of the key roles, I thought, for the mission command. Now, how do you stay current in airplanes when you're with NASA waiting to go into space? So the nice thing about that is NASA has a fleet of T-38s that they use for uh, space flight readiness training. Right. 
and you can fly them different places. And in a lot of ways, the stress of taking an airplane on the road and going someplace you haven't been is a good prep for spaceflight because you're dealing with challenges. You know, I haven't been to this field. Did I prep properly for what's going to happen when we get there? Do I know that they, there's gas to fuel me? Have I managed the weather and figured out? And then playing that back and trying to figure out a way to accomplish your mission. Sometimes the weather is not cooperating and you have to deviate a little bit or uh, you come back. Knowing when to say no and not go is also a thing that we look at right. when uh, the guys are flying. Right. So I, it was a funny feeling when I got more hours in the T-38 than I had in the F-14. Well, how long were you with NASA? 15 years. 15 years. That's I a lot about of 15 fun. years in the Navy. Yeah, but more hours in a T-38. Yeah, yeah. We have one on display I here. I was looking at that. I was wondering if it's one I'd flown. It might be. Check your logbook. Yeah. I've been looking for astronauts that have this in the logbook, number 913. Yeah. But I got that airplane because it actually flew the chase missions with Enterprise. Oh, yeah. Oh, in 77 cool. when they did the, yeah. the test landing. They still had some of the guys who had flown those chase missions at NASA when I got there. The, they were the... Uh, uh, not astronauts, but the, the fleet pilots that right. worked at AOD. Right. But uh, the training for flying into space had to be a whole different world. Uh, what about crew cohesion? Did they, I, I know some of your uh, STS-125 crewmates, especially Mike Massimino, Massimino. And he just talks about that crew being just a bunch of best friends. And were they all like that? I mean, you flew four times. When you when they put a crew together, did they try to get guys that are and women too the like each other? Or is it mission driven? It's probably more mission driven than uh, personality. But personalities are part of that, too. You need people who can work together safely. One of the things you learn in spaceflight is it's not an individual sport. Everything we do, we want to have somebody backing us up. You know, hey, I need to throw this switch. Is this the right switch? Yes, you're on the right switch. Throw it. And learning to train together and work with each other and play to each other's strengths and understanding what people are like. One of the things we did before that last flight is we took a trip to Alaska for National Outdoor Leadership School. and We went out in kayaks. Uh, for 10 days, we kind of deployed out. It was really like a uh, space mission because you had launch where they took you out in a powerboat and then post insertion when you figured out what you were doing with your stuff. <laughs> then you had flight day one where you started paddling. And we took turns with leaders and we had discussions about things. We had one time where we were talking, OK, what should we do? Uh, where should we go tomorrow? And we talked and had different opinions. And one person said, well, you know, we really need to do this. And if we don't do that, that's the stupidest thing ever because this is the only right thing to do. Talk for some more and decided, well, you know what? We're going to do this other thing because of this and that. And I was kind of concerned that that person would say, well, that's dumb. I'm not going to go along with that. But you got to see how people responded and said, once they'd been heard, they were willing to do what you decided as long as you let people get their viewpoint across. But there's still a commander. You still have, sometimes word. have to make a call. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what about that feeling of going? And I've asked every single astronaut I meet, I ask them the same thing. And the answer is always different. That first launch, the sensations of it, what's it like? I mean, the, the rest of us that are all earthbound, we like to know this stuff. Well, so you're in the sim for maybe a thousand hours and you feel like you know everything that's going to happen because you've done all these practice launches. Uh, but you suit up and you get out there and you're lying in the seat for two and a half hours before launch on my first flight. And uh, the countdown's going along and you think, well, you know, this is, this is another sim. You know, it, you, your mind just says, OK, nothing to worry about. We're just going to have a sim. But then at six seconds, the shuttle main engine start up and the vehicle starts shaking. You're like, huh, that's a little different. And then five, four, three, two, one. And at T minus zero, the solid rocket boosters go off and boom, there's no, you, you jump off the pad, the vehicle's rocking and rolling like this. You're like, wow, we are not in a simulator anymore. <laughs> this thing is going somewhere. And then uh, as you're going through the thing, you know, the shuttle simulator would tilt back and you'd feel more pressure on your back like you're having G-forces. Well, when you get real G-forces on you, there's no doubt that you're getting your chest compressed. Uh, on my first commander flight, we're going uphill, and you, you know, uh, uh. but the thing I learned about as a Navy guy is you got to sound good on the radio. So <laughs> the call would come up, uh, 
uh, Columbia, Houston, two engine town. Oh, okay. Roger, Houston, two engine town. <laughs> well, the whole world's listening to you. Right? Digger turns to me, Scooter, how can you talk? <laughs> Another question I always ask astronauts, when you finally achieve orbit and you look out the window the first time and you see Mother Earth, is it, is it, is it goosebumps? What, what is it? What, what happens? I actually got my goosebumps a little early on my first flight because you launch and you're inverted and you have a roll to heads up. And you could roll the heads up either for the commander or the pilot side, depending on where you are. So you're doing about Mach 13. You're at about 400,000 feet. And we did the roll the heads up and my cockpit swept the horizon line. So I looked out and I saw the curvature of the earth and the blackness of space behind me. And I'm like, wow, this is cool. And then they're like, okay, get back to work. We're still going somewhere. I've got things to do. But that first look is something I'll never forget. I don't think I could look away. I don't yeah, know if I yeah, could look away. It was a challenge. We're going to move towards the front of the airplanes. I think we're, we're under the wing and we're falling out of light. The sun's ah. setting here in New York City, and it's just a, it's a beautiful evening. It is a beautiful evening. You're really lucked out. So and what's the job of the backseat guy here on the So, F again, it's a team. We cover that. You know, each, each position is key. So the pilot flies the landings and uh, takeoffs. The Rio operates the weapon system. He's the guy in charge of running the radar, tracking the targets, uh, and backing the pilot up. And you really have to work as a team. Probably the biggest problem for me with the movie Top Gun is when they get jumped by uh, uh, Jester, I think, in the one point. And they're like, oh, we got killed because we were dumb. No, he got killed because Goose wasn't checking six and <laughs> looking out and saying, hey, Maverick, break off. So that's the Rio's job, you know, looking around, keeping a head on a swivel and checking behind you all the time, in addition to running the radar for when you're looking in front. Pretty good visibility in that bubble can. It's not too. bad. Yeah, definitely better than uh, the F4. Yeah, that's kind of a hole for the Rio in the back of that. Not as much forward visibility. We had a lot of questions from visitors when they see the F-14. They see them all on TV and they're all gray and camouflage or uh, and combat markings. And... Uh, this one is red, white, and blue. This was uh, a Grumman test airplane. It never served in the fleet. It's actually the seventh. It's a very early bird. Did you? This is an incredible airplane. It was the premier flight test airplane after they lost the first airplane with the hydraulic. Guy. But Ship 7 demoed everything. They were the first with the new engines. They rent, turned it into a D with everything up front. An amazing airplane. It was a blast to fly. And uh, you flew this and one? this, yeah. Built in New York, Beth H. flown out at Calverton on Long Island. So it's really fitting that it's here at home in New York City. New York City, yep. It was so much fun going up to Calverton and flying and doing the different tests that we did. Did, did you do in-flight refueling with this? We did, yeah. There's a refueling door is right there where the Grumman is. Oh, right here. Yeah. And it's kind of funny because you, you see that panel there. Some airplanes... You can see pictures of them, and they've taken that off. And that's that's because um, back in the Gulf time when we were flying off the KC-135, it has this giant iron basket that you would try to refuel on. And if you missed, it would pop off and sometimes rip that thing off. And it could go down the intake, which would be bad. So take the door off. So they took it off. But when we went and we're doing that, I said, no, we're going to fly our planes the way they're meant to be flown, and we're going to leave it on, and we're not going to rip them off. And we did. Did you have any real combat time in any uh, in theater areas? Southern Watch. Uh, I had uh, two calls where we ran on a bogey, but before we got very close to them, they turned away and, and ran away. So <laughs> scared them off. A bogey. What, what was it? Uh, it was, uh, yeah, a Iraqi uh, MiG, probably. Yeah, too bad. Could have showed him who was boss. How are we doing on time? We got five minutes. Is there any questions out there, Alicia, that, that come in? So actually, yeah, we had one real quick. Um, does the REO have the ability to fly the plane in an emergency? Okay, so the question was, is the Rio, the what does Rio stand for? And does radar he, intercept officer. Does he have a capability of flying the airplane if you're incapable? So in the F-14, the only controls are in the front. The back seater has controls to operate his radar and slew the uh, slew the radar basically with a little hand controller, but there's nobody flying but the front seater. 
so if you're incapable of controlling it, he's got to kind of take over and yeah. make decisions. A, a friend of mine who was a Rio first and then converted to be a pilot flew with a guy. In, uh, he was in the back seat. The guy was in the front. And his front seater had a heart attack at the ship. And he's like, oh, I'm not feeling good. You know, all the things you would have with a heart attack. But Pig was able to talk him in. I mean, because Rios can really help pilots uh, and and give you advice on what's going on and stuff. Uh, and he got his guy in. He took a trap, and they pulled him out of the cockpit and uh, flew him off the ship, and Pig never saw him again. He wow. survived, I think, but he was off flight status. So uh, you mentioned real quick there there was a Rio who then became a pilot. Was Did that happen? It, NASA, uh, Navy was doing that a little bit. It was called the uh, Rio Retread Program. So you'd have guys who are really good in the back seat. I mean, if you had a, a top Rio in the back, you could be doing a dog fight with somebody and you just listen to what the Rio tells you to do. Or roll right, pull, pull, a little more, roll right. And you know, oh, there's a bogey. Okay, shoot him. You know, uh, they were worth their weight in gold. Uh, and so sometimes you say, hey, let's take that experience and move it to the front seat. Did former Rios make good pilots? Most of them. Some of them... <laughs> That's why the Navy quit doing it. There were a few guys who got a little cocky, I think. Yeah, yeah. But uh, these Rios, did you fly with the same Rio all the time, or was it a different guy, or did you? was there crew continuity? You would try to have a crew continuity when you started out, but the way the flight schedules work, you'd wind up flying with different people at different times. Uh, the skipper would normally have the same Rio that flew with him if he was a pilot. Sometimes your skipper was a Rio, and he would want a pilot that he flew with most of the time. And you would see that happening. But I was a schedule officer for a while, and trying to match and keep everybody like that was just impossible. All right. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up unless there's any other questions. Yeah, we could absolutely chat with Scott and Eric all night long, everyone. But we do have our Q&A with our members right after this. Um, so, yes, I do. Unfortunately, we do have to wrap up our program for this evening. But once again, just want to say thank you so much to our curator of aviation, thank Eric Bain. And, awesome. of course, our very special guest, Scott Altman, for that amazing tour of the F-14 and for sharing so many incredible stories with us tonight. What a special treat to have you with us and talking about such a cool plane. Well, thank you very much. It's an honor uh, to be here. I just, uh, for me personally, thank you very much well, for coming out. No, so Awesome. This is just great for everybody. So thanks, Alicia. Off to you. All right. Thanks so much. And yeah, everyone, thank you all for tuning in tonight and for joining us as well. Uh, as a reminder, if you are an Intrepid Museum or Atlas Obscura member, we will be having this exclusive Q&A session with our guests as soon as this broadcast ends. So check your email for the link to that or contact membership at intrepidmuseum.org if you are having any issues. And of course, if you enjoyed tonight... Uh, well, we've got some other exciting things coming up. We're going to be looking into just one of the many, or many of the other treasures, rather, at the Intrepid Museum. We have so many historic aircraft. Uh, we've got so many other really cool things on board. We'd love for you to come check them out. But also, we do have to keep them up, right? We have to take care of them. So please do consider making a gift to support the preservation of planes just like the F-14 and other historic aircraft at the museum. And you can do that just by visiting support.intrepidmuseum.org. Also, as a reminder for everyone, our museum is open to the public seven days a week. So if you are in the area, come on by, check out the amazing F-14 yourself in person right up on our flight deck. And also, don't forget, Fleet Week is just around the corner. So join us on site at the museum throughout Memorial Day weekend for even more fun activities for the whole family. So everyone, if you've got any other questions, reach out to us through our website, intrepidmuseum.org, or through any of our social media channels. But otherwise, thank you so much for tuning in tonight, and we will see you next time.